Okay, so um, I will follow on Conrad's talk, and I will talk about the uh, reuse and the sharing of data and how important it is to the greater community to have the data in the database so that others can use it. And um, this is a quote from a fortune cookie. Uh, it says, the best thing to do with your data is, will be thought of by somebody else, meaning that somebody uses the data, deposits the data for a specific reason. They're, just, they're studying a certain gene or a certain type of bacteria, and someone else will come along with a different application, take their sequence, compare it to the sequences in the database, and learn something about their sequences without studying the same organism that the other, um, the original depositor was studying. So this is an example. Um, this was an example from uh, in, in the early 1990s where um, a gene was found to, that was thought to cause human colon cancer. And when we took the sequence of the, pro the protein sequence of the human colon cancer gene and we compared it to what was in the database, we found that the amino acid sequence was very similar, very, pretty highly conserved with a gene from yeast and a gene from E. coli. And since a lot of genetics had been done on yeast and E. coli, um, the function of the gene was well known and it turned out to be a DNA repair enzyme. So, it was asserted from the similarity to the E. coli and the yeast genes um, that this human gene is probably a, a DNA repair enzyme as well. And bacteria are thought to be at least 3,000 million years um, evolved. Humans have evolved 3,000 million years away from bacteria. So conservation in certain proteins are important and um, the reuse of the data uh, led to an important medical discovery. So I'm going to start talking about a project that we've been involved with for the past uh, 10 years or so. It's the Barcode of Life project. And it was, it, uh, it was found that uh, there, you could take a, a small bit of sequence from mo most organisms, from all animals, um, a mitochondrial gene sequence, and sequence a 700 base pairs of it and be able to identify species based on that little 700 base pair sequence. And this is analogous to, so they called it a barcode, because, and it's, so it's analogous to the barcode that you see in the supermarkets that you could determine what a, an item is. For instance, this water, it would, you would know it's an Evian water based on the fact that it has a barcode on it. Um, so we did something similar uh, with the uh, DNA sequences. So uh, we worked with the community who were developing the barcodes and we came up with the standard because we wanted to make sure that the barcodes could be reusable by other communities. And so the part of the requirements were they had to deposit the gene sequence into GenBank. Um, they had to deposit the raw sequence at the, the um, the, the GenBank record was uh, derived from. They had to have a taxonomic identification. They had to have a link to the uh, specimen so that one, uh, somebody could go back and look at the specimen. Um, they needed to provide us with information, if possible, about where the specimen was found, um, when it was found, and by whom, and also who, by who made the taxonomic identification. Um, and we had a standard for quality. And the, this was important because um, we wanted to ensure that the, da the data being in the database uh, made it a permanent archive so that others could reuse it. They could, users could come and compare their sequences with other barcode sequences. And um, barcodes are currently used in a number of cases for uh, both regulatory and forensic work. And I'm going to go through a couple of different case studies just to give you some examples on how they're being used. Uh, oh, actually, first I will show you an example of a GenBank record. So this is the GenBank record. There's a link from the GenBank record to the publication so you could learn more about the study that was done. Um, within the source feature region, we have a link to um, the latitude, longitude, as well as the country. 
And so you could look on a map and see where the specimen was found. We also have a linkage to the specimen page at the museum where this gecko is being stored. And so that information along with the sequence um, allows users to take an unknown, uh, an unknown sequence from, a barcode sequence from an unknown organism. And if it's highly similar to this one, can assume that they found a, this species or a related species. So um, one thing, one practical function of using barcode sequences is to understand species diversity. And this is a study in Costa Rica of butterflies. And um, each row represents a single species of butterflies. And the first and the third are the males, uh, the dorsal and ventral view, and the second and fourth are females also dorsal and ventral. And you can see that within a single species, the spotting patterns of the male and females are different. And each row represents a different species. And in a lot of ways, the males all look more similar to each other. And the females look similar, more similar to each other. By, but by doing the DNA barcoding, they were able to discern that these are four different species. And there are a number of different examples where species were, species were determined based on their barcode sequence. And um, so another uh, practical use was, is uh, looking at fish. Um, DNA barcoding has been used to find in a number of cases uh, that the food that you think you're buying is not necessarily the food that you're getting. Um, the two high school students in New York started this as a project where they went to different fish markets and restaurants and um, took, took samples of the fish, then went back to the lab and took the specimens and did, did the DNA sequencing and found in many cases for what they thought were, they were snapper, um, they, was, they had uh, replaced it with tilapia or another cheaper fish. And, so, and um, since that study, there have been a number of different studies um, there was one in the UK, in Canada, and most recently in Los Angeles, where a large percentage of the food supply for fish is not actually what it is. And they've done these studies with um, health supplements as well and found that whatever plant products were in the ingredients were not necessarily within, um, within the, uh, the, the packaging. And... Um, this has important implications both for um, knowing what you're eating as well as people who have al allergies or sensitivities, if they happen to, if they thought they were getting salmon and, or tuna and wound up with something else that they were allergic to, it have, could have serious implications. Um, the last example I will give is that they're using barcoding in um, trying to prove when poachers uh, go after endangered species or um, other related th species. So these are the pictures I have here, are leather products that were in the Congo, um, where they found that they were from an endang endangered lizard based on the DNA barcode sequence. Um, this is a plant in South Africa, it's an endangered plant that was stolen and they were able to, when they found, it was, they were able to, um, when they found the, the people who stole it, they were able to prove that the sequence, the D, by DNA sequencing, that this was that endangered plant. So um, the reuse of data in GenBank uh, is extremely important for, in a number of ways worldwide. And now I'll turn over uh, the, the microphone to Karen, who will talk about some medical implications. <laughs> 